Okay, guys, welcome to uh, uh, Wednesday night virtual church. And if you're watching, I'm glad that you remembered that we was going to be uh, taping on Wednesday night. Uh, don't forget to um, uh, continue to pray for our church. Uh, we've had several. I think we're over 20 that tested positive, but I think all of them's doing well and, and getting um, uh, uh, better. And But just be praying for them and praying for our church. Uh, and then, uh, and of course, this... This Sunday will be virtual as well, uh, but you know, if you want to look ahead, I'm going to be in Acts 18, verse 24, and then go through uh, chapter 19, verse 10, talking about Jesus over everything, and then Sunday night, it'll be Romans 14, 5 through 9, as we continue to talk about gray matters, but the, both sermons are going to be wonderful, it's going to be challenging, and, uh, and then the 25th, hopefully, uh, we'll be back together physically as the, fam- uh, as, as, a, as the family of God, and so... Uh, I'm just excited about you being here tonight and, and just uh, that you're watching. And I just know God's going to speak to our hearts uh, in, in, in Ephesians chapter 3. So if you've turned there, Ephesians chapter 3. So the first uh, uh, verses of Ephesians 3 in many ways are the key to this entire letter. Uh, Paul describes for us the great mystery of the faith. A lot of people, you know, love a good mystery. And we're kind of fascinated by what is hidden or secret. Uh, waiting to be discovered and revealed. Uh, Proverbs 25, 2, it says, It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but to search out a matter is the glory of kings. A few years back, uh, one of our vacation Bible school uh, t- was titled uh, uh, Truth Trackers, The Secret of the Stone Tablets. And it led our boys and girls in just a search or a mystery to find out the secret of the stone tablets. And of course, the secret was the Ten Commandments. And the secret of salvation is our Lord Jesus Christ. So in this text, Paul describes for us the greatest mystery of life, something that's been unknown before the coming of Jesus, but is now revealed fully to us. And so we want to uncover the mystery that Paul is talking about. So let me just begin by reading verses 1 through 6. For this calls I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if you've heard of the dis- dispensation of grace of God, which has given me to you to you word, how that by revelation he made known unto us the, me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand by my, my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ by the gospel. Let's go ahead and we'll pray, and then we'll look at these uh, verses uh, uh, individually. Uh, Lord, our Heavenly Father, we just love you very much, and thank you for this time that you've given us. We just come out and study your word. And Lord, we do pray for our church, that Lord, you continue to be with us, and and Lord, with all those that's going through this COVID, that that Lord, just be with them and just heal them quickly. And that Lord, that Lord, that we could come back together here in just a week or so, that uh, again, as, as, as your family and and that, Lord, that we'd be that light that you call us to be within our community. Uh, Lord, we just know that you're in control of all things. And, and that, Lord, that you're going to use it for your glory and, and for our good. And, and so you're going to bring something wonderful out of this that we're going through right now as a church. And so, Lord, uh, right now, I pray that these, the, your words would just encourage your people. Uh, that, Lord, we'd be excited about what it means that this, this mystery is talking about that, that we have in Jesus Christ. And, and so, Lord, just right now. Uh, just bring that encouragement uh, to uh, to uh, our family. And, and, and Lord, if someone's not saved, that you just bring that conviction that they would come to you and receive into their heart even tonight. So we thank you so much for what you're going to do with this message. Amen. Well, first, just notice a prisoner of Christ. You know, Paul says, for this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. So Paul begins by saying that for this reason, and then talks for 12 verses until he tells us before he comes to that reason. In verse 13, he says, Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulation. That Paul wanted these Christians to, uh, that he was writing to to understand why he was going through persecution, why he was going through this imprisonment. So he writes this letter as a, as a prisoner of Rome. Uh, he's under house arrest. Uh, he's chained day and night to a Roman soldier. You know, many of the Christians in Ephesus wondered how God would allow just such a great missionary, missionary to be imprisoned. You know, how this missionary's voice would be shut up within four walls. 
how his missionary feet is in chains and, and reduced to, you know, conducting his ministry through letters. A pastor was asked to be a, a character witness at a, a child custody trial. And the first question the, the prosecutor asked was, Reverend, do you think that a man who has been in prison is fit to raise a child? And he kind of expected him to answer yes or no, but instead the pastor said, I guess it depends on the man. You know, some very famous people have been in jail and, and who've made just an impact upon the world and made, a better, made it a better place. Think men like John Bunyan or Apostle Paul. You think of the men that God changes in, in, in prison that gets saved and comes out and just does wonderful things. Well, Paul reminds his readers here in this chapter that he is a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He doesn't say that he's a prisoner of Rome or, or of Caesar, you know, awaiting Nero's judgment. Uh, he saw himself as a prisoner of our Lord, accountable only to the judgment of God. You know, Nero did not have the final say about Paul's life or Paul's death. Listen, God did, and Paul was content to live free if that would serve Christ. He was content to die if that would serve the cause of Christ. He was a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Oh, he existed to serve Christ no matter the cost. He would bear, you know, any suffering to share the glorious news of Jesus, even if it meant imprisonment, even if it meant death. Now imagine how our, life, our lives and our attitudes toward problems and sufferings would change if we viewed our lives in the way that Paul viewed his. You know, our, our point of view, listen, that makes all the difference in the world. There was three workers helping Sir Christopher Wren build the St. Paul's Cathedral. And each were asked, you know, why, what they were doing. And, and one answered, well, I'm just cutting this stone to, to, to a particular size. Another said, well, I'm earning a living. But the last one answered, I'm helping Sir Wren build St. Paul's Cathedral. Listen, if you was asked why you do the job that you do at your work, would you say, well, I'm just doing that to make a living? No, I'm, I'm doing it because, you know, I'm told to. Or, or would you answer, I'm doing it for the glory of God. I mean, are you an employee at that factory uh, uh, or are you an employee of Jesus Christ? You know, if you're a farmer, do you do that because your father was a farmer? Maybe grandfather was a farmer? Or you do that, I'm a farmer of Jesus Christ. Or, you know, if you're a homemaker, is it because your husband or your children kind of expect you to do that? Or you're a homemaker for Jesus Christ? Whatever you do, you should be doing it for the glory of God. You know, when we're undergoing hardship or, or unpopularity or material loss, we can regard ourselves as victims, which our world does, of course. But, or, you know, as Christians, we're to regard ourselves as champions for Christ. That we know that God's in control. God will see us through. Oh, Paul was not a prisoner of Nero, he is a prisoner of Christ. And so we must look at life through God's eyes of providence. You know, the Lord is in control every factor of our lives, whether it's good or bad. He's in control, you know, when we're sick. He's in control what's going on with this COVID thing within our church. He's in control uh, 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 in, when there's injustice done to us. Listen, God will use that in our life for his glory and to bring us good. So are you a prisoner of Christ? And then next, notice here, Paul says that he's a prisoner of Christ on behalf of the Gentiles. Uh, if you remember the story of Paul's arrest, you know that was the reason he was arrested. He was in prison because he was ministering to the Gentiles. So the Jews were just outraged that Paul would treat them as equals. And you know, when Paul uh, was arrested at the temple, he began to speak to the, Jew, uh, to the Jews Oh, and the Jews, man, they would listen intently. They was listening respectfully. Man, until his testimony uh, come to that, that the Lord uh, said to me, go uh, and I will send you away to the Gentiles. Can you just imagine at that point the crowd flew into mur murderous rage and they shouted, rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. Oh, the, the, the word Gentiles just caused them to see red. Uh, they were out now to get See, uh, uh, Paul, for Paul's blood, uh, they would have uh, uh, stowed, um, stoned him on the spot if it was not for the Roman soldiers. And so Paul was a prisoner of Jesus Christ for the sake of the Gentiles. He staked his life. He staked his liberty on preaching the gospel. He would die for the truth of God's word. A prisoner because he dared to proclaim Jesus. Oh, in chains for his uh, testimony. No, Paul, he didn't expect the, uh, the way of service to be easy. 
You know, he didn't expect you know, loyalty to Christ would just be a trouble-free life. You know, someone has said, may God deny you, you peace and give you glory. Uh, F.R. Uh, Maltby said, Jesus promised his disciples three things. They would be absurdly happy. They would be completely fearless and in constant trouble. In church, we're promised the same thing. And we should be like the knights at the round table who ask for dangers to face and dragons to conquer. Oh, to suffer for Christ. It's not a penalty. Listen, it's, but it's glory. An opportunity to show the world our loyalty to our Savior. You know, the Lord had a plan for Paul in prison. It gave Paul time to write the letters to the churches. It became, you know, much of the New Testament. The Lord was in control, just as he's in control of your life, just as he's in control of our, our church. But let's hope we never have to, you know, go to prison. We don't want to be persecuted, but, but you may be in a difficult situation now at work. You may be in a difficult situation with maybe a boss, your co-worker, or maybe in your home, maybe something going on with your spouse or your children, or maybe even someone, a brother and sister within our church. If so, let the Lord deal with that, and he will will set you free to love and to care and to minister to them. Oh, Paul was a prisoner of Christ for the sake of the ministering for or to the Gentiles. And in second, just notice then the administration of God's grace. And this is good as we go on to verses 2 and 3. If you've heard of the dispensation of grace of God, which is given to, to me to you, to you word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in few words. And so notice here, Paul wanted the Ephesians to understand that he was going through those trials because God had made him a steward of his grace. You know, Paul was responsible for managing and ministering God's grace. He did not receive the, the gospel from men. He received it from Jesus himself. The Holy Spirit revealed God's truth to the Apostle Paul. All the great truth of the New Testament were, were given to him directly from the Lord. The mystery of Christ was revealed to him. Oh, it was Paul's responsibility now to share that truth uh, with the Gentiles. You know, he is a custodian, if you would. He was a servant. He was a steward of God's truth. He preached the grace of God. You know, through God's grace, they, they could have eternal life. And, you know, Paul was not only a prisoner of Christ. Listen, he was also a minister of Christ. You know, he didn't view his service to Christ as a burden. You know, he didn't view that as something, a uh, wearisome duty. It was just a great privilege. I was thinking in terms, when our nominating team, you know, wor uh, works to get our teachers and officers each year, you know, sometimes that job can be like pulling teeth. You know, like twisting arms to get someone to serve. Oh, please, please, you know, will you teach this class? Would you sing? Would you do this for Christ? And, oh, uh, nobody else, you know, is stepping up here. Could, could you just do this, you know, for this year? Listen, church, it should never be that way. Oh, we should be volunteering to work for the Lord. The nominating team, that should be the easiest the team to serve on within our church. To give our time and talents, to give our substance to the Lord. That's not duty. It's not just a responsibility, but it's a great privilege. It's a great honor that we should gladly accept. And you know what? I praise God because so many of you have that type of attitude. And then notice here, all Christians are, are responsible to witness of God's grace within their life. Man, we've received the gospel. We received the truth. Now we have life. We, uh, we, we have eternal life. And, and we want to share that, uh, that grace with others. You know, every minister of God, every Christian is a steward of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to serve him no matter the cost. Matthew 20, 28 says, Even as the Son of Man came not, uh, to, not to be ministered or to serve, serve uh, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so because uh, we know the secret of life, we know the mystery of Christ, we're to shout it from the mountaintops. So Jesus is the heart of all things. If you, know, if you read the newspaper, watch the news on television, if you listen to talk shows, you know, it's clear that, that we live in a troubled time. And people are seeking answers to the mysteries of life. And, and we worry, you know, about pollution. You worry about riots or climate change. 
People worry about poverty or war, racism, all the crime that's going on, divorce, or fa- uh, the, they worry about the family or violence. And, you know, we worry about this COVID thing or uh, child abuse, drug abuse. It's just on and on, problem after problem. You know, some will promise one solution, others promise other solution. But the truth is the, uh, is the core problem is sin. And the only key to solve that problem is the Lord Jesus Christ. H.G. Wells said on his 65th birthday, I'm 65 years old and I have never found peace. There was a college student who said that he was majoring in philosophy because he had an empty spot uh, within his life. And he actually thought that that would fill the void, but only become more fed up with life. A British social leader said, I have everything to live for, but I have lost all desire to live. There was a Hollywood movie star, took her life and left the explanation, I'm lonely. You know, someone said, science tells me I'm a blob of protoplasm. Psychology likens me to a rat running through a maze. Philosophy tells me to find reason for my running. Historians talk on and on about our past. Uh, Statisticians and, and sociologists talk about our future. I listen but they can't tell me who I am and what I am uh, doing here or where I am going. Listen, church, that's the great thing about being a Christian. We know the truth. We know the meaning of life and death and salvation and eternal life. We are stewards. We're servants of God's grace. Oh, find someone this week to share God's wonderful truth, God's wonderful grace of salvation with. And in last, just notice here, The revelation of the mystery. Notice here verses 4 through 6. Whereby when you read, uh, ye may understand my knowledge in the mysteries of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. It is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That the Gentiles should should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Oh, the mystery had been hidden in the past. You know, the greatest men in the Old Testament didn't understand the mystery. It was unfolded. It was revealed in Jesus Christ. Matthew 13, verse 34 and 35 were told that Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without uh, using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter Things hidden since the creation of the world. Because in Christ revealed to us things that had been hidden from the very foundation of the world. Oh, the mystery. Listen, the mystery is this. The unity of the Jew and Gentiles in Jesus Christ. Now, I read that. You know, my first thought was, Paul, you've already talked about that in chapter 2. Or you may be thinking, well, what's the big deal? Why does Paul, you know, uh, keep hammering away at this thing? You know, it's, uh, it's time to kind of get off that soapbox. It's time to kind of move on uh, uh, here. Um, but the reason, you know, we respond that way is we just don't realize the, uh, uh, the racism, the hatred that exists between the Jews and the Gentiles. And so when Paul says that these two groups are one in Christ in those days, listen, that was unbelievable. No one or nothing could ever bring those two groups together. Oh, remember Paul, listen, was actually in prison for preaching this truth. Oh, the new equality of the Gentiles, that was a bitter, bitter pill for most Jews to swallow. I mean, for centuries, they had uh, uh, prided themselves. Man, we're God's chosen people. We're God's favorites. And now that they're going to have to, that was all shattered. And they're going to have to to share uh, that with the Gentiles. That God loved the Gentiles just as they loved them. And so God was bringing the two together in one new body with all the same rights. We had the same privileges. Jew and Gentiles would share equally. Fellow heirs, they would be given the same blessing. We had the same life. They'd be one body with the head Jesus Christ. Be given the same spirit, same life. Listen, it made no difference to God that Paul had been a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I mean, he'd been a trained rabbinical scholar, a zealous Pharisee. Folks, in the church, he was an equal partner with a Philippian jailer, 
with a runaway slave, Onesimus, with a previously demon-possessed girl. We are all equal in Jesus. Oh, the mystery that Paul reveals here, the mystery that Paul's talking about, it is the family of God. We're one body. Listen, our human birth determines our racial distinctions, but our spiritual birth unites us as members of the same body. You know, Christ is the head of, uh, and each of, uh, of us share uh, in the ministry. Oh, it's wonderful when someone prays and gives their life to Christ. Isn't salvation just fantastic? Isn't it great? Listen, that's not the end of life. That's just the beginning. That's the beginning of a relationship with God, a relationship with one another. You know, it's so sad when a believer doesn't understand how they fit into the family of God. They try to be lone rangers. They're trying to live life alone. They're trying to fight the battles and fight Satan alone, handle uh, their struggles alone. But since we're a family and we love one another and we're to support and we, we care for one another. You know, Paul actually here, and I love this church, he actually uses three new words to describe our relationship with one another within the church. Look at verse 6 again. He says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs in the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So we're joint heirs, joint bodies, joint partakers. Uh, Philip translated, we're equal heirs with the chosen people, equal members, equal partners in God's promise. The NIV, I like how it, how it translates. It just repeats the word together. Heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, shares together in the promise of Christ Jesus. So let's look at these three wonderful truths individually as we, uh, and this will kind of uh, uh, finish our message out. But first, just notice we're joint heirs. Joint heirs has to do with possession. You know, men were created to have dominion over the earth, but because of sin, the ground became cursed, and now the earth is, is gripped by the, the law of decay. You know, scientists will call it the, law of therm, uh, the second law of thermodynamics. It's entropy, that everything is running down, everything is deteriorating. But the good news is in Jesus Christ, God began a new creation, and, and we are resurrected from the dead and, and given life. We inherit uh, 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 from uh, God the world. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, you just read that, uh, verse 21 and 23. So therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Paulus or Cephas of the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours, and you are Christ, and Christ is God. Isn't that exciting? One day all the creation will be revitalized. It will be restored and renewed, and we are joint heirs with Christ of his creation. And we're told he, he who is faithful will inherit all things. When Jesus comes into his kingdom, when he comes into glory, listen, we will inherit all things with him. Someone has written, my father is rich with houses and lands. He holds the wealth of the world in his hands. Of rubies and diamonds and silver and gold. His coffers are filled and his riches untold. Listen, we will inherit all things one day. You know, sometimes I think the problem is we want his riches now. Uh, when things don't go the way that we want them to. Or, or um, uh, we kind of question God's love for us. But Jesus promised us in this world, uh, I will give you peace. I will give you forgiveness and a lot of trouble. And we say, Lord, you know, I appreciate that first gift. Man, who doesn't want your peace? That second gift is awesome. Man, I need that forgiveness over and over again. But could you kind of return that third gift? You know, I don't really care about the trouble thing. But listen, church, that's a part of being a Christian. And God doesn't take us through difficult circumstances to discourage us. He wants to grow and mature us. It's to remind us that there's another world coming. That this is not our inheritance. Our inheritance is heaven. He said, if they persecute me, they'll persecute you. But in the future, listen, we're going to own it all with the Lord Jesus Christ. When Reverend uh, Francis Light was about to die, he, he wrote this. 
It says, change and decay all around I see. Oh, thou who changest not, abide with me. Oh, we're heirs together with our Lord Jesus Christ. And in second, just notice here, we are joint members of one, one body. Listen, that's the answer to the age-old problem of why we can't seem to get along with one another. It answers the problem of family breakups and arguing and strife. You know, even church divisions and malice and hatred, racism that we see, crime and war, all the struggles, all the battles of humanity are answered uh, uh, by our becoming joint members of one body. You now, we can't get along with one another because of division and strife. Listen, that's a part of that sin nature. That's a part of that flesh. But when we are born again, we live by the Spirit. Now we can love one another. Now we can forgive and reach out to one another. Oh, the whole experience of life has been transformed. We become one body, and that can only happen when we all grow in that love and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Martin Lord Jones said, said of this truth, we are all equally sinners. We are equally helpless. We have all come to one and the same Savior. We have the same salvation. We have the same Holy Spirit. We have the same Father. We even have the same trials. And finally, we are all marching and going together to the same eternal home. Oh, we're to function. This is a strong, a healthy body. If I start walking you know, down these steps, you know, from our stage here, and I would slip the fall, my, my arms would automatically go out to try to protect my head, try to protect the rest of my body. And church, that's how the body of Christ is to function. Oh, have you ever taken the hit for somebody else uh, when they're falling? Isn't that how we're to love one another? We're members of one body. We share the same life. We're connected. Oh, don't ever think if you're backslide that, that it doesn't affect anybody else within the body. Oh, if you're not walking with God, that, you know, listen, it affects the whole body. This church and the ministry is weakened because of you. We're part of one body. We share the same life. We share the same heavenly father. We're members of the same family. You know, many times as Christians, we don't, we don't get along because we build up walls uh, in our hearts. You know, walls that bring division. There was a man who was uh, offended by his pastor in some way. And he said, you know, from that point on, I would never listen to his messages and that's terrible because, you know, when I speak or a Sunday school teacher speaking, we're speaking from God's word. We're speaking God's word into our lives. Now, I hope I never offend anyone uh, uh, because we don't want division. Uh, sin divides, but humility and forgiveness and reconciliation strengthen and it unifies us. We're equal heirs. We're equal members of the body of Christ. And so don't let Satan divide. Don't let Satan split the church. Unless there's unity, we can never be all that God wants us to be. We can never, uh, we can not, uh, can be physically present. Yet, that I know many churches are divided uh, over uh, issues. There's a wealthy man and gave a lot of money to a hospital in England. And with one stipulation, he said, when I die, I want my body fixed up and wheeled into the boardroom every year for the annual meeting. And sure enough, they did this, and every year they wheeled him in, and then the chairman would say, Jeremy, beat them present, but not voting. Listen, you may be listening uh, to me tonight, and you're present, but you're not voting. You're not part of what is happening. Oh, if you let any barriers grow up in your heart against a brother or sister within your church, or uh, let the Holy Spirit, listen, tear that down right now, because we are one body in Christ. And in last, we are sharers together, he says, in the promise of God. Now, what promise is Paul talking about here? It's the promise of Jesus that after, you know, he left, the Holy Spirit would come into our lives and empower us to do everything that God uh, requires of us. Everything that God wants us to do in building his kingdom. You know, Jesus told his disciples to go to Jerusalem and wait there until uh, they were given the power of the Holy Spirit. They would be baptized in the Holy Spirit. They'd be filled by the Holy Spirit. That took place at Pentecost. Oh, the great mystery is a new, a marvelous way of life. 
Colossians 1, 27 says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of his mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You know, we must choose to become a part of God's new creation or we remain in the old creation. We cannot be in both. Uh, we await uh, uh, the dawn of a new world and a new life and a new day. On that day, all God's people shall be one uh, over all the earth. There'll be no more sickness, the Bible says. There'll be no more sadness or death, no more war. You know, Paul never got over the wonder of the great doctrine of the church and his responsibility in proclaiming the good news of Jesus. And church, may we never get over the good news of the body of Christ. Oh, may we stay excited about the family uh, that God has placed together as, as, as Oakville Baptist Church. Oh, the secret of Paul's message was the love and the mercy, the grace of God for all people, no matter their race. God sent Paul to the Gentiles to open their eyes so that they would turn from darkness to light, turn from the power of Satan to the power of God, so they would receive forgiveness of sin and be saved. Oh, Jesus died for all people, everywhere, in all times. He died for you and me. Oh, no matter who you are, God, uh, you can approach God through his wonderful son, Jesus. God is right uh, uh, now creating a new body of people made up of people of all nations and races centered around the Lord Jesus Christ. So why don't you come if you don't know him and become a member of that wonderful body? A uh, theme for World Changers one year was nail it down. And in one service, they had a cross at the front of the church. And, and they, the speaker asked the teenagers if there was anything in their life that would keep them from the Lord or keep them from walking with God, uh, if they'd come down the aisle and nail that to the cross. And listen, that's what I want to close with tonight. I'm asking you to do the same thing. Oh, if the Holy Spirit has spoken to you in some way, Perhaps over some pet sin you'd allow back into your life. Maybe some ungodly attitude, some bitterness or hatred you have against someone within the church. You know, if there's some walls that has been built up in your heart, nail it to the cross and ask God's forgiveness. And if you're a Christian, you, you'll never be happy until you do that. And if you're watching and you're not a Christian and I come, listen, kneel at the cross and accept the one who has died for your sins. Oh, Jesus wants to give you eternal life if you'll just come to him. Amen and amen. Lord, thank you so much for this wonderful world that you give us tonight. And Lord, I know you've spoken to each of our hearts. And Lord, may now we not just be hearers, but doers. May we apply it to our life. And Lord, may we never, never uh, take for granted. May we never, never forget just how wonderful it is to be a part of your family. And we give you the praise for it all. Amen. Okay, Zach.